We're going to continue our series on the kingdom parables today, and we are going to look at probably the single most famous parable that there is, other than the Good Samaritan, the prodigal son. How many of you have heard of the prodigal son? Probably most all of you. Uh, most all of you have heard of the prodigal son, even if, even if you don't know the Bible and you're not a Christian per se, the phrase, uh, oh, that person's a prodigal, it, it's a familiar term culturally because of this parable. Uh, last week, Jason opened up with chapter 15. Pastor Jason opened with chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Let me read that for you. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. The context is this. Jesus has come to initiate a kingdom, his kingdom. His kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he's initiating the kingdom of the gospel, and the gospel is the means by which people enter into that kingdom. And there's a problem, slight problem. That is, those who were longing and looking for the coming of that kingdom are upset of the individuals who are being admitted into the kingdom. They're grumbling. It seems as if tax collectors and sinners are the ones who tend to be drawn towards Jesus, and this just doesn't jive with the Pharisees and the religious leaders. So he tells, tells them a parable, a couple, three parables. We looked at two of them last week, the parable of the lost coin and the lost sheep to, 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 to teach the audience, those who are listening, that God has a heart for those that don't know him. And he seeks out of his own initiative to bring them into the kingdom. And when they're brought in, he expects rejoicing. He expects rejoicing. Now, if you watch that video, everyone cheered at the baptism. That's an appropriate response when people come into the kingdom, rejoicing. But not everybody rejoices. And so last week, we looked at two parables that, in, that, that communicated God's heart for the lost and communicated that we ought to have that same heart. But here's the thing. Neither one of those parables actually communicated or taught us how to get that heart. It says, you ought to have this heart, but it doesn't tell you how to get that heart. It just talks about God's heart. We're going to look at a parable this morning that does both. It shows the heart of God, but it also, it points to the power and the source by which we can have that same heart. That kind, of, that kind of power that changes us from the inside out. We sang about it, the last song we sang right before the video, Amazing Grace. We're gonna be talking about God's amazing, scandalous, scandalous grace. There's three acts to this play, if you will, if you look at it as a play or a movie. Act one is the son's request, the younger son's request. We're going to learn about the scandal of what theologians refer to as common grace. And, and the nature of sin and, and God's scandalous common grace towards, towards all those who are on this planet. And then we're going to look at the son's return as the son comes back. We're going to see the scandal of God's covenantal grace, that kind of grace which establishes an unbreakable relationship, uh, a relationship as of an adopted child. And then third, we're going to look at the son's rejection, the older brother's rejection and the response to scandalous grace, and then we're going to talk about what is our response. How do we respond? So open your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. We're going to start in verse 11. Let's pray and get to it. Father, we thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Lord, we ask that your grace would be abundant, your gospel would be clear, and that Jesus would be exalted this morning. Help me to preach and teach in such a way that he is honored. And Lord, I pray that as there are many people here, I pray that you would speak to their hearts as individuals. They have different needs, different wants, different hurts. They're at different places in their lives. And I pray, Father, that your spirit would speak to each heart here this morning and that we would not receive your grace in vain. Help me to present this word in such a way that Jesus is honored. It's in his name we pray, amen. Okay, here we go. So, a son's request. This parable starts out, Jesus says, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. And he, being the father, divided his property between them. Okay, the context here is there are two sons, an older and a younger, and the younger comes to his father and says, Dad, let me give you the essence. Dad, someday you're going to kick the bucket. You're going to die. 
And when you die, I stand to receive about a third of the estate. Because in our generation, first century Judaism, the older brother got two-thirds of the estate. He was expected to run the family business and run the farm. So the younger son is saying, Dad, that day is going to come. We all know it's coming. You're going to die. I'm going to get a third of everything that you own. So can we just skip the formality of waiting for you to die and you just give me what you're going to give me when you're dead? That'd be great, thanks. Okay, now, we see what the father's response is here in the text, but let's just do this for a second. Let's pretend like that last line is whited out and you don't know how the father responds. If you were the dad in this scenario, how would you respond to your 18-year-old son? Dads, how would you respond? There's one guy back there just shaking his head. <laughs> shaking his head. Best case scenario, you'd shake your head and say no. Worst case scenario, if you were not necessarily filled with the Spirit at the moment, you might want to club your son. You might, at, at least minimally, you'd say some choice words, would you not? Okay, how many of you would actually divide your property and give it to him? Anybody? No, no one would do that. Okay, look what the father did. He divided his property between them. The word property, which is translated in English property, the Greek word is bios. It means his sustenance, life, bios, life. It means that which he derived his living from. So what this dad did, essentially, was he liquidated a third of his assets so he could give the son those liquid assets so he could do what he wanted with them. How many of you think that that, that sounds reasonable and wise? Good, good. It's not reasonable. It's not wise. But remember last week when Jason told us what a parable was, what the word parable means? The word parable means literally to come alongside. In other words, Jesus is telling a narrative that comes alongside reality. So the parable's not meant to just tell a, a story about a dad and his rebellious son and his older brother. The story is meant to communicate something about the nature of God and nature of man. Let's take a look, first of all, the nature of man. The nature of man is this. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Last week, Jason mentioned this in the parable of the lost sheep, that Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, says that we all, like sheep, have gone astray, each of us to our own way. Here's the reality. Here's the reality. Man desires the gifts that God has to give, but man does not desire the giver of those gifts. Does that make sense? In other words, we want the air that we breathe. We want good health. We want the taste of steak or pizza. We want the joy that comes from loving relationships between a man and a woman. We want the joy of seeing kids grow up. We want all of these things. We want good jobs. We want to enjoy leisure time activities. But we don't want the interference from the Heavenly Father who gives these gifts. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 1, verse 24. Uh, 22, Acts 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of God for, the, glory of God for the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. In other words, here's the status of man. Man is in rebellion. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yes, we want those gifts. Give us what we need to be happy but could you just stay out of my life? I have it. Thank you. That's humanity. That is every single person here. Now, some of you are like, wait a minute. I'm religious. We'll get to you at the end of the parable. <laughs> this is a universal issue. This is a universal issue. So man wants what God has to give, but we don't want God. We hold him at arm's length. That's clear, right? So, what does God do? He gives us what we want. He gives us good gifts. Do you realize that you can hate Jesus and have a loving family? You can be an atheist and refuse to consider the possibility that there might be a God 
And the God that you refuse to acknowledge exists still allows you to draw breath. You see how that works? In other words, he gives bios. He gives life. He gives us that which brings us temporary joy and we don't even have to acknowledge his existence. It's the parable played out. Do, do you see how God doesn't say, well, wait a minute. Are you going to acknowledge my existence? Well, then yes, you can have the joy of a marriage with sexual fulfillment. Did you say you don't believe in me? Well, then no. That's not how it works. Theologians refer to this as common grace. Common grace is the grace of God by which he gives people innumerable blessings that are not part of salvation. So this grace, grace means gift. That's what the word grace means. It's, it's, the Greek word is charis. It means gift, that which is given, not worked for. So God gives gifts to men regardless of their, their faith or lack of faith. He just, he just gives. The, the rain that falls on the unbeliever's crop also falls on the believer's crop. That's just the way it works. God gives gifts. And it has nothing to do with whether or not man acknowledges God's existence. That's common, common grace. So, reality though, common grace doesn't satisfy. It never satisfies. It, there is joy in life's pleasures, but ultimately they don't satisfy. Let's, let's follow the parable out. Verse 13, not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, took a journey to the far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. That word squandered there, the Latin word is prodigal. That's where we get the phrase prodigal son. It means to squander. It means to waste. So he squandered his pop, uh, property in reckless living. And when he'd spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired, hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. God also, in, order, in, order, in, in addition to common grace, he gives us the gift of pain. He gives us the gift of pain. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Problem of Pain, says that uh, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but pain is the megaphone which rouses a deaf soul. So in other words, we, we go through life and we're enjoying all of these things and, and like the book of Ecclesiastes, the author that we looked at this, uh, this winter, we, we, we realize that all of those things which we thought were going to bring us joy, those gifts of common grace, food, pleasure, uh, success, money, sex, all of these things, which in and of themselves are pleasurable, they don't ultimately satisfy they don't ultimately satisfy. And look at verse uh, 14. And he began to be in need. In other words, he began to realize that all of that stuff that he wanted from his dad doesn't technically fill his soul, doesn't fill his stomach. Ultimately, he begins to be in need. He begins to feel some pain and he begins to suffer, he begins to suffer. Now, eventually he realizes that, okay, maybe I've made a mistake. Maybe I've made a mistake. Now the son begins to contemplate his return. The son's return, act two here. Contemplating repentance, verse 17. But when he came to himself, uh, could be translated, when he came to his senses, when he realized what he'd done, well, this is stupid. What am I doing here? In other words, he wouldn't have got there had the pain not, the, the pain not been ramped up suffering the consequences for his own foolishness. And he begins to, he says to himself, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Okay. He realizes the error of his ways. He realizes that the reason he's in pain is because of his own foolishness. And he comes to his senses and he decides, I need to repent. I've sinned against God. I've sinned against my father. I need to go home. How many of you have at one time been that wayward son? You did run off and then you came back. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but there are many of you 
who are not quite on the way back, but you are starting to come to your senses and you're beginning to think this through. You're doing what he's, he hasn't left the far off country. He's in the process of considering the return home. And some of you are there. Some of you are there. Let's take a look at what's going through his mind. First of all, he, why is he saying this? What's the circumstantial occasion for his repentance? Pain, pain. So he's in pain. The gifts the father had given him have not satisfied his soul. And he's out of cash. He's out of cash, which is helpful. That, uh, that, that way he is, he's forced to deal with the reality of his choices. But he also reveals that he sinned against heaven primarily, but also against his father. So he sinned against his father. He's also, his father in heaven. He's also sinned against his father on earth. And he begins to go back. But notice what he says. Verse 19. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. True statement. He's not worthy to be called his son. But look at the next statement. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He's not saying this to his father. He's rehearsing what he's going to say. So here's his plan. He plans to come back into his father's presence and not plead the rights of his son because he has no rights of his son. He has no rights of his son. He plans to plead his father's mercy and ask not to be considered a son, but to be considered one of his servants, a field hand. In other words, I'll work my way back into maybe a relationship with the father. Now, just let me pause quickly and address those of you who are on the way home or considering coming home. Some of you have been the prodigal, and you're the prodigal right now. You're not living as you know you should. And if the things which are, are, are true of your life were put on a screen, you would be embarrassed. You'd be embarrassed. You wouldn't want those things to come out. And you're, you're, you're ashamed. You're ashamed. And some of you are like the prodigal. You're broken about it, in a sense. It's, it's painful to you. And so one of the reasons, potentially, that you might be here in church, at Grace Community Church, or any church for that matter, is because you think that by coming to the church, you can put yourself in a place where you can reform yourself morally and serve God as a servant and that by serving him and proving to him that you can obey and that you can do the things which he's called you to do that you screwed up, that maybe someday, capital M, maybe, maybe someday you could maybe be part of the family. That's what's going on here. He's not looking to be reinstated as a son. He's looking to go home as a servant. I want to caution you this morning. If you are in that state of I'm coming home and I want to come to church so I can learn how to be a better person so maybe I can serve God and maybe he'll love me, you'll be sorely disappointed and gloriously relieved at the same time if you follow the end of this sermon all the way out because he's not going to let you back in as a servant. So verse 20, he's contemplated repentance. Now he's in execution mode. I'm going home. And he's walking home. Verse 20, and he rose and came to his father. Came to his father. I'm going to stop right there. Okay, we're watching the movie. You're eating your popcorn. The sun arises and he starts to go. In your minds... You know what he's going to say because he's rehearsed it. How do you think the father should respond? Be honest. How should he respond? How many of you vote, I think the father should accept him? Raise your hand. Oh, you guys are liars. <laughs> there are a few of you. And those of you that raised your hand, do you know why that you feel like he should accept them? Would you like me to tell you why? It's because your culture has been informed by 2,000 years of this parable. That's, that's just the way it is. We think that we should accept the prodigal because of the prodigal son and Jesus' teaching. That, and that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But, the re, but that's not the way a first century Jew in Palestine would have thought. That's not the way they would have thought. So let's take a look at how, how he responds. 
So while he's still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. Now the Greek word here for compassion, it means mercy. It means he had pity. That's what compassion means. To have compassion, to have compassion means to have pity. So he feels sorry for him. Now why is this kid in pain? Why? Because he put himself there. He said, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me a third of all you have. Okay, here it is. And now he's in pain. And his dad feels sorry for him. Do you realize that your heavenly father feels sorry for you in your misery, even when your misery is completely your fault? Do you know that? That's the kind of God that, that you serve or run from. Either way, doesn't matter. That's how he is. He sees you in your pain, even when you shake your fist at him, and he has mercy and compassion. He feels pity for those who shake their fist at him in their misery. <laughs> Do you live your life like that? When your teenage son or daughter comes home and they're in pain, do you feel for them? Yes, you do. So even at a human level, you get this. But it doesn't compute. See, the way you feel for your rebellious child is how your father feels for you only times infinity. He has compassion. Now, how does he exercise that compassion? He ran and embraced and kissed him. This is a, a patriarchal, honor-based culture. Okay, women and children run. Grown men, patriarchs, the heads, estates of families, don't run. You know, to run in, a, in a, a robe, you have to hike it up. Okay? It's not dignifying. And he sprints down this gravel road and he embraces his son. Now, has his son given him the repentance feel yet? No, he hasn't even done that. He sees him moving towards him and he seeks out his son embraces, kisses him, and the son begins to go through his spiel. Father, I've sinned against heaven before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That's exactly what he said he was going to say. Now, remember, who's listening to this parable for the first time? Who's the audience that Jesus is speaking to? It's not a trick question. They're Pharisees and disciples. There's a mixture of tax collectors, sinners, and the religious. So there's a whole mixture of people, but they're all first century Jews. They're all first century Jews. They all live in a patriarchal, honor-based culture. Okay, that is their world. That is their world. This is scandalous. Absolutely scandalous that he would run and embrace him. So, but here's what they would think. How should he be received? So remember, you're listening to this parable in the first century. You've never heard the story. It's not the most famous parable in the world. You've never heard it before. You're just hearing the story about a, a younger son who rebelled and ran off and now he's returned. So how should the father react? This is from Kyle Snodgrass. He's a New Testament scholar and it's a, par it's a book on the parables, stories with intent. He said, the ancient world, uh, uh, the, the, in the ancient world, disrespect towards parents, especially fathers, or a failure to care for parents was condemned, even to the point of saying that neglect of parents was an imprisonable offense. Even if such imprisonment was not true specifically in Palestine, it shows how deeply, deeply respect of parents was associated with, res with respectability, honor, and conversely, shame. According to Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 18 through 21, the Old Testament, rebellious sons were to be stoned. Okay, so this is how the first century would have understood what should be done with this son. He could be imprisoned, he could be stoned. Best case scenario, he should be shunned. Or at least taken out to the edge of town and beaten. Does that make sense? So that's what the audience is expecting to hear. And what do they hear? The dad hiked up his robes and ran down the street, embraced him and kissed him. Now he starts to repent. Now he starts to give him his spiel. Now, if you're a parent and your rebellious child comes home, what would you say after they said, um, uh, 
Father, I sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your, your son. What would you say? How? Yep, you have. How many of you would acknowledge, thank you for acknowledging your fault? Uh, or you would fish, you would fish to see if the repentance was genuine. So tell me what lessons you learned about financial investment. You, you would at least, would you, how many would you go there? I, I want to know. Did you learn anything? I want to know. Are you coming back just because you're hungry? I want to know. That, that, does that sound unreasonable or mean? Sounds very reasonable. Let's take a look at how he responds. But the father said to his servants, he doesn't even address the son. It's like, yeah, 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 good repentance spiel. Anyway, <laughs> so he starts to address the servants. Bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put the ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. They began to celebrate. What actually happens is totally unexpected. It's, this is scandalous. This is scandalous grace. The whole culture, the village, expects this kid to be beaten and driven out of town. And instead... Best case scenario, if the father's feeling really generous and merciful, it's like, okay, servants' quarters are down there. Work starts at 5 a.m. Best case scenario. Instead, he says, no, 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 no. None of this servant talk. We're going to put the family ring on your finger. We're going to put a robe of honor on you and sandals on your feet. We're having a party. We're having a party. Because the son that was dead to me is now alive. The son that was lost has been found. We are going to celebrate. That is absolutely scandalous. The verse that Mark read before we sang Amazing Grace, Romans 5, verse 15, but the free gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following the trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. That's what grace is. It's a free gift. It's a free gift. And it's absolutely scandalous because what does this kid deserve? What does he deserve? He deserves condemnation. He deserves the pain that he got himself into. And what does he receive? The full rights of sonship. <laughs> on, on the basis of what? On the basis of his merit? On the basis of, of his potential? No. On the basis of the love of the Father. It always starts with the love of the Father. Notice what he... You, no. He didn't say it, but it's implied. No, no. You're not going to work yourself back into the family. You will be made a covenantal part of this family by my grace. And that's the scandal of covenantal grace. And unlike common grace, it does fulfill. It does satisfy. Let's look at the older brother's response. The older brother, out in the field, working, responsible, righteous. His older son was in the field, and as he came and he drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. Your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. Okay. Again, you don't know the story. What do you think the older brother's response should be? Yeah, it depends on what the older brother's motive is. It depends on what the older brother wants. Now, it's impossible for me to say, pretend like you don't know what happens next because you do know what happens yet next. It says, but he was angry. But he was angry and he refused to go in. He refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. The word entreated, it means he pleaded with him. He's begging his son to come in. Okay, now, remember patriarchal, honor-based society. 
He's lowered his dignity to run out to meet his rebellious son. And now he has to go outside and beg his older son to come back in the party. Okay, you've been at family gatherings, right? So if, if you see dad at Thanksgiving and you got 30 people in your home, all of a sudden the party stops and dad gets up and goes outside on the front porch and older brother won't come in. What's, what happens inside the party? What's going on right now? Everyone's watching. That's what's going on right now. The head of the family, the one with the honor, the one with the dignity, the one who bestows all gifts, is begging the older brother to come in, humiliating himself. And the older brother is shaming his father. And everyone's watching. He answered his father, look, these many years I've served you, I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatty calf for him. He's ticked. He is hot. Why is he angry? Because it seems that the younger brother received through disobedience what the older brother has never been able to achieve through obedience. What didn't his father provide that really ticks him off? It's right there in the text. I just wanted a young goat. I just wanted a party. Turns out he's exactly, exactly like his younger brother, only completely different. <laughs> Here's how they're alike. Here's how they're alike. Both of them want the father's stuff. That's the want. Got it? One of them has the cojones to go straight to dad and said, I wish you were dead. Give me my stuff so I can enjoy it without you. Right? The other is way more subtle. He reasons, I'll work for him to get the stuff but I don't want him. That's not very obvious, is it? A uh, friend of mine, Lincoln McElravey, three-time NCAA champ, Olympic bronze medalist for University of Iowa. When he was a freshman, a upperclassman who was a NCAA champion gave him some advice. This, you'll see exactly how this applies. If not, never mind and just pretend like it applies. <laughs> the upperclassman, the senior who was an NCAA champ, said to this young freshman, just win and Gable will leave you alone. Do you, do you get it? In other words, if you don't win, he'll be on you. But if you just win, you don't have to have a relationship with it. That's what a lot of religious people are like. Come to church, you obey the Ten Commandments, kind of, you think you do. And your religiosity is a way to keep God just at arm's length. Not in a far off country, but just out of the reach of your heart. And it turns out you're not any better than your younger, your younger brother. It turns out you want the exact same thing he wanted. You just want your dad's stuff. And then when you don't get it, you're ticked off. You're ticked. Do you know how you know you're an older brother? Oh, gosh. I hope, no, never mind. I was going to say something dumb, like I hope this doesn't offend, like that matters. <laughs> How many of you have ever said these things? You've been angry with God because your life didn't go the way you thought it should. Anybody? Just let's have a moment of vulnerability. Do you see how many older brothers are in this room? If you have ever said to God, God, I have given you my life and you didn't do this. You have the heart of an older brother. So what does that tell you? 
It tells you that if you were really brutally honest with yourself, what you really, really long for in life is your father's gifts and not the father. You're not different than the younger brother. And then when you see someone like that younger brother come into God's blessing, you just, why him and not me? That, that's just an indicator that the human heart is pretty ugly. Even if you've been in church your whole life. I got a push notification on my phone. I got to figure out how to turn that off. But it was one of those little news things. And it was, I don't know how they, how, I don't know how your phone does this. There's algorithms. It'll send you notifications for articles that think you might like. <laughs> they nailed it. <laughs> Given the fact that I'm preaching this sermon, it's CNN. <laughs> Enough said. Anyway. Here's how the article opens up. Growing up as an evangelical, Pete Holmes thought he was doing everything right. He believed the Bible, all of it, and said he didn't smoke, drink, or have sex before marriage. He went on mission trips to Africa. He played bass in the worship team. He could have been on that Momentum video. Uh, and even wore pleated khakis. I draw the line right there. <laughs> then one day, as Holmes was struggling to kickstart his comedy career, his wife left him for another man. His world and his belief in God exploded. I felt like the Lord hadn't help, held up his end of the bargain. Holmes writes in his new memoir, Comedy, Sex, and God. And I was ticked off. There you go. That, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. That's the older brother. I believe in God. I've served him my whole life. I haven't done this. I haven't done that. I haven't done this. And then my wife left me. Or then I got cancer. Or then my wife got cancer. Or then the bottom of the economy fell out. Or then this happened. Or then that happened. Or then my family fell apart. Or then every, swirling, swirling, swirling. I didn't deserve that. You didn't even give me so much as a young goat. All these other people are prospering, but not me. Ooh, ooh, that's ugly. But that's the reality of the human heart, the heart of the religious, the outward obedient. Let's take a look. <laughs> More scandalous grace. At this point, in a patriarchal honor-based society, you expect the older brother to be beaten. And... The father says, son, you're always with me, and all things are mine or yours. It's fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this, your brother was dead, and he's alive. Alive, he's lost, and he is found. In both cases, whether they're talking about the younger brother, the rebellious individual who says, I want nothing to do with God, or the older brother who outwardly complies, but inwardly doesn't really want anything to do with God, in both cases, he has to leave the party. In both cases, he seeks both out, lowers himself to reach them. And in both cases, in both cases, in the case of the younger son, he says, you are my son. For once you were lost and now you're found. Once you were dead and now you're alive. None of this servant stuff. You're my son. And in this case, he reminds him, it's not your past service that makes you my son. It's the fact that I'm your father. That's what makes you my son. In both cases, he says, listen, you're not going to serve me to be my son and your past service doesn't make you my son. You're my son. That's covenantal grace. That's absolutely scandalous, and it's absolutely undeserved. Now, both cases, he went out to get his sons, and he reminds his son that their sonship was never based on works. But here's a crazy thing. We don't know if the older brother ever comes in. How many of you ever watched a movie and the credits begin to roll, and you're like, oh, wait, wait, what, what, what happens? What happens? You can't end a movie there. Okay, how many of you have seen the movie Inception? 
the spinning top. How's the movie end? The top starts to wobble, and then the credits roll. What? Was it a dream or not a dream? Now, some of you are like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> the illustration is lost on all of you. However, all of you have seen a movie where you're like, you don't end a movie there. You've got to, there has to be some resolution. One way or the other. And that's the end. The end credits roll. It leaves you hanging. We don't know if he goes in. I don't know if you're going to go in either. Some of you are wayward sons and daughters. You're contemplating a return to the Father. I don't know how it's going to end. Some of you think that by working and, and, and serving God or coming to church or being a better person, maybe he'll accept you as a son. I'll tell you how that's going to end. It's not going to end. You'll never be worthy. But he offers his free, undeserved grace and your response is only to receive it and to celebrate. Some of you are older brothers. You, you, you know you should have a love for people that don't love Jesus, but you just don't. It bothers you that those people are not moral like you. You don't want to hang around them. You don't want them in your household. You don't want them in your church. You wouldn't hang out with them if someone twisted your arm. You feel yourself, if you were honest, to be morally better than them. And God's like, oh man, you don't understand my scandalous grace because you're not that awesome yourself. <laughs> but man, do I love you. Would you just, would you just come in? to the party? Would you just receive the scandalous grace of God and stop trying to rest on your righteousness? For some of you, you need to come home. And repentance is made possible because there was an older brother, an older, older brother, not the one that wouldn't come in. The older brother Christ who paid who gave his bios, his life, for the rebellious son and for the older brother, who paid the cost of the fatted calf, who himself was the offering for that party. He invites you to the wedding supper of the Lamb, regardless of whether or not you are righteous or think you are, or regardless of whether or not you are so wayward and know you are. The older brother Jesus has paid the price. So repent of your sin and repent of your righteousness because both of them are keeping you from the family. And realize that it is all of grace. God's completely amazing, scandalous grace. Just end with a quick illustration and then we'll pray. You know we just sang Amazing Grace, right? Most famous hymn ever. Can we agree on that? You know who wrote Amazing Grace? John Newton. Big deal, John Newton. Fig Newton. That's what, John Newton was a pastor in England. But you know what John Newton did for 30 years of his life? He was a transatlantic slave trader. He was a wayward son. Generally, in our culture, human trafficking is a bad thing. He made money off of the trading of human beings. And he came home. He was lost, but then he was found. We know how the end of the story ended for him. I don't know about you. Make today your homecoming. Let's pray. Father, right now, in this room, there are prodigals and there are older brothers. Some are not in the midst of the family because they're pursuing a life of rebellion and sin. And some refuse to come in because they think they're too good. God, would you break both of those groups? 
Would you break them and bring them to their senses that they might receive your grace? They might receive your scandalous, amazing grace and accept a place at the table as sons and daughters of the king. Jesus, thank you for paying the price for our admittance. And I pray, Father, that your joy would be our joy in knowing you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Go in grace. We'll see you next week.